I were here with Dr. Carl Prebrum, who came from a very different background of neuroscience and neurosurgery, and you have brought a lot to that field, and I think our field owes you some of the background of what we do to your work. But I know you don't do biofeedback, and I'm curious what you get out of being around this field. What do you get from biofeedback, and what do you see? Take a look at him. That's what I see. People here, they're practitioners, and so they see problems that need solving. I find going to conferences is sort of like postdoctoral education. You go, and if you learn nothing else, you learn how to present your own views in a context, find the right words so that you can portray like you did this morning. You know, these take, it takes you practice. You have to try it, say it this way, try to say it to, to make yourself understandable. So if nothing else, when I speak, I learn how to express what I have been thinking about. But the other part, of course, is that other people are doing the same thing, and so you learn from them ways of expressing some of your own ideas. You have been a, I think, called a maverick uh, at times throughout your career for some of the theories and for the work that you've helped pioneer. We, as a field, are, are treated somewhat as mavericks. And I wondered if you had any words of wisdom or perspective to offer a struggling maverick field. Sure, if you think you're right, keep at it. I, after a year at Yale, we discovered the excitability of the, what is now called the limbic system, we used to call it the olfactory brain, electrically stimulating, and uh, uh, it gives rise to blood pressure changes, gastrointestinal changes, heart rate changes, all of that. Well, big, huge finding. Some Nobel awards wrote in and said, to John Fulton, who was my chief, he said, no, this is bullshit. Uh, they're stimulating the dura. That's why they're getting all these things. And John was you know, enough of a guy to say, he, just, he owned a journal of neurosurgery, uh, of neurophysiology, and he published it. Well, three years later, every graduate student at Yale and everywhere else were doing you know, stuff on so-called limbic systems. Uh, so I overcame that one. When we, when, I, uh, when we wrote Plans and Structure of Behavior, one of the reviews said, uh, these guys have been working out in California. They obviously had sunstroke. Uh, another one was a more favorable review. It said most people don't get seen out until they're at least 60. These guys aren't even 40 yet. So uh, that's a kind of review where 10 years later, it had changed the whole field. Every president of the APA, American Psychological, had mentioned it at least once, if not two or three times. And you know, the thing took off about five years later, about 10 years later, and now it's a classic. In fact, that's where I'm going to Sacramento to help discuss what's happened to the whole idea of cognitive psychology and cognitive neuroscience. So we had a symposium at Stanford many symposium on my holographic ideas. It was a very nice conference. Some of the people pointed out some very nice things that I hadn't thought of and so on and so forth. But most of them said, this is all bullshit. They came out of uh, biology. They came out of uh, psychology. The engineers were there. Everybody was there. And they just said, you don't know what you're talking about. The brain is, uh, this, these things can't have anything to do with the brain. And afterwards, one of the graduate students, uh, anyone, he and I held forth. And we acknowledged, you know, they hadn't thought of this, and that's a good object. I mean, it was very open, easy discussion. Another graduate student came up to me after and said, well, how could you stand on that? Everybody's saying you're wrong. Very simple. I've always been right. <laughs>
brain and perception is only about 10, 15, 10 years now. And, um, nobody's paying any attention to it at all. And, and, and it's not an easy book, but uh, it's got all the data reviewed there out there. And that's why I wrote it. It was meant to be a technical book. Language is a Brain, when I wrote it, was meant to be a book for engineers. And they have just, you know, I was recently at a meeting, uh, engineering meeting in Orlando, and a lot of South Americans came, and three presidents of universities came who were engineers. And uh, they all gathered around me, and uh, I was asked to be the honorary president of the whole meeting, which I didn't know, which meant I had to give a talk the next morning after I got there at 8 o'clock at night. But anyway, uh, they all gathered around and said, we were raised on languages of the brain. Uh, all of them had read it when they were in school, and they knew all this stuff. So, of course, it was translated into uh, Spanish and Portuguese. And in this field of neurofeedback, uh, there are many competing different approaches to helping move and shift the brain. Many people often feel their particular approach is the right approach. It seems like many different people are getting very good success with different approaches. And we don't know enough, I don't think, to know. Do you have any perspective for us? Yeah, they probably all were right. They're getting some results. The problem is that any new therapy always works. The newness of it. All of a sudden, somebody's paying attention to you. And the outcome can be, in psychiatry, it's usually one-third get very much better, one-third sort of get better, and one-third don't get better. And that's for any therapy that's ever been used. Uh, and the other thing is different people need different kinds of therapy. So if it doesn't, if one kind doesn't work for somebody, they go shopping until something does work, hopefully. And what's lacking in this field is any kind of uh, field that's clinical, uh, that's sort of no good diagnostic. We don't have good diagnostic uh, uh, categories. And so we can't tell to a bone, oh, you go over here and he'll be able to, oh, what you're doing, the next guy comes in and says, that won't do you any good. If you go see him, he'll do better or her. There's many different ways to get there as well. That's right. And these are so often called placebo effects, but they're not just placebo effect. They really are effective, but for different reasons for different people. You shared with us a copy of your brain map, your very unique and different brain map. And you see the changes in amplitude rapidly shifting, which we now show in our courses, and people are just amazed. Can you tell us a little more about why that evolved and, and what, what that represents? Very simple. Uh, setting up a new lab in Virginia after being at Stanford for 30 years. And we had new equipment, supervised students from uh, Virginia Tech, uh, getting their degrees. In, and they laughed, you know, with the stuff that we brought along. Everything right now, um, every, I, I've always given away my lab to my students every five years at least. But in this field, with computers now, five years is a long time. I brought uh, tapes, you know, IBM tapes and stuff like that. Nobody can read them. Nobody can read my floppies now. I mean, so you have to redo the whole lab over and all over. Well, so we're setting up new stuff, new equipment, and so on. And we needed to see if it worked. So I said, okay, I'm tired, moving, and all of this. And I fell asleep part of the time, and I sat down, and I got up. That was a very happy time. Next thing I knew, this engineer from China, uh, Lin Shei, 
created me these things, and this is what your EEG looks like. I said, what? And it was just a tremendous surprise. None of us suspected that the EEG changes or you know, what we call the pop-up rate. It was just incredibly fast, 100 to 150 times a second. And then, of course, came the science. How do we measure it? As you heard this morning, if you can't measure it, it's not science. And so we devised a way of making maps, which are the maps where we connect this every two milliseconds. Here's the highest amplitude. Here's the next two milliseconds. We might draw a line. Here's the next one. We draw a line. And so we make these maps, uh, and they're unique to people pretty much, and unique to the problem that they're trying to solve, and we're going to make some science, and we've done, that's what I presented here, three or four other techniques that we've, that have come from that, such as measuring complexity, and measuring uh, using factor analysis to sort of check on, each technique sort of checks on the other one and sees if we get the same thing, what we found is, Things go even faster in older people. Their reaction time, their behavior slows down. Brains go faster. Hmm. More complexity. There's more complexity, exactly. Uh, at the same speed, they go at the same speed, but there's more complexity to uh, what they're processing. And what, what does more complexity mean? Very good question. I wrote three papers saying, I don't know what the hell people mean by complexity. It's just a bunch of you know, words and so on. We know from fractal geometry that you take one level on one scale and go to another one. It can be just as diverse. So what do we Well, for the EEG, one of my friends, again, and I had, in fact, published on uh, uh, this many, many years ago. It's what I call the structure of redundancy. Instead of looking at how much information, how much reduction of, re of uncertainty goes on, there are repetitions. So if you have A, B, A, B, A, B, that gives you a certain amount of information. A, A, B, B, a, A, B, B, A, A, B, B gives you the same amount of information. A, 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 B, 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 C, 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 same amount of information. It's a structure of redundancy. A double A is not like a single A, is not like a triple A, is not like a fivefold A. Well, this makes a big difference because the if it's just one or two, the redundancy is either zero, which would be one, or two, or three, if it's in that ball game, the front part of the brain and the medial parts, the big areas, uh, make it very difficult for the animals to do that. But when you get to five or more, they do, by using the discrimination, they go to the back of the head and use that. So it's a, you know, and I did those experiments years and years ago, and I talked about structure of redundancy about that. Well, it turns out that this is, the, if you take the levels, and what you do is you give each redundant, anything that's repeated over and over again, you give it a new label. So let's say A, A, B, B, A, A, B, B. If A, A repeats, or A, A, B, B repeats, then you say, this is X. And if another one comes in, that's A, B, C, 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 A, B, C, C, A, B, C, C, A, B, C, C, you know, we give that a Y. And so you have another. Then you look at see if X and Y repeat. X, X, Y, X, Y, X, you know. And if, if you see a repetition, you give that a new label, an like N and N. That's the way you study the structure of return, and that's complexity. So I had to write another paper. Okay. Complexity, what does it mean in a practical standpoint? Practical standpoint, you've got to look at different levels. 
deals with the structure of redundancy. Not just the redundancy, but how the different scales, levels of redundancy it gives you a hierarchical structure. Okay. So the, the diversity at any one level can be the same as the next one. But that structure is different. Jay, did you have a comment on that? Or just questions? You might have had well, a comment. I think Hjorth's descriptors, uh, the slope descriptors by Hjorth, <coughs> field of EEG, speak to complexity, uh, a derivative of something like uh, um, you have a, a, a distance, the derivative of distance is speed, miles per hour, and then you have the derivative of that, which is acceleration, miles per hour, per hour, <laughs> and you, you, you end up with higher levels of derivation. And Hjorth's descriptors of the EEG um, were activity, there's 8 hertz activity, mobility, what's, uh, what, what's the activity across this frequency spectrum, and then complexity, and these are higher levels of, of derivation. I think this brings to the EEG literature, which is kind of an obscure EEG literature, I must admit. Hjorth's works are not exactly uh, intro, but they're also, uh, I think, well published in the field of EEG. This brings complexity to the EEG world. The other thing is, um, was it two years ago now, I believe, they actually uh, had a fellow who used a measurement of complexity and fed it back and found that individuals could actually control. You can show a learning curve in your complexity. So when you're talking about biofeedback, increase in complexity that occurs with the, some people would say aging, but I would say uh, maturation of the brain, the development of the brain, which does not stop when you're 6 or 8 or 10 or 12 or 22. Well, it stops briefly in the sophomore year when you know everything. Oh, well, I, 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 that was the year I entered the field and I thought I knew something. It was a good illusion while it lasted. <laughs> yeah, so, so you see these, there are roots to this that go back uh, to simple calculus of differentiation and, and integration and so on. So they're, they're, these are all the old rules. Yeah. And we did, uh, you, you can use complexity measure power spectral density. And if you, it's really, what you do is you draw a line across where the amount of power is in which frequency band. And if it's a straight line like that going up, uh, to the higher frequency, this is normal pretty much if you've got an ADD, it gets flatter and sometimes even goes down, but only here, not back here. Actually, these were adult ADD not off any uh, medication, but it was, for me, that wasn't publishable because just a few cases. So. But we, we did that. And there are all kinds of ways that you can use the EEG uh, in very, uh, very effective ways. And if you two try to do the same with your computer, put a few electrodes on the case of the computer, try to figure out what program's running, you're going to have a hell of a time. And we do it here, and we find out all kinds of things. Uh, and I have another story about an earlier question you asked. Uh, we were promoting somebody at Stanford who was an EEG person from associate to full professor. He made his name into very beautiful work. You know, nothing outstanding, but even when he was at the VA, he wasn't in the, you know, tenure faculty. He wasn't in the same group as those tenure faculty, so it wasn't quite as difficult. But the calls I got from the other faculty were not in, uh, in brain science or anything like that. Is this really science that this guy is doing? Looking at all those wiggles? 
And it isn't that long ago, 15 years ago, 15 years ago. Yeah, the, the EEG isn't real. Only if you got electrodes down in the brain are you really looking at something real. First the of EEG all, is and some heavy phenomenon. even that isn't real unless you get spikes. Yeah. Uh, With the microelectrode, everything is microelectrode. Yeah. So and lots of life, what yeah. I've done is all microelectrode. But, uh, has led to, but the EEG and the DC stuff, you know, you get yeah. DCs off of oak trees. Yeah. You know, birds work at Yale. I mean, that's where I was introduced to it all. And, and plants have good DC potentials. And there was some uh, a puzzle a, a botanist was, was his office or something and he was seeing people and stuff and these plants every once in a while had this huge DC shift I mean just horrendous <gasps> what was going on and who was doing what and so on couldn't figure out for weeks but they sat there and really you know, monitored and said, they finally found out what it was the ladies' room was next door, and whenever they flushed the toilet, the plants. <laughs> yeah, that's true, man. DC chef. I mean, you know, these things have been played with and known for years and years. Do you think our field, and, and I know this is actually a question for both Jay and Carl, do you think it's important for our field to expand and add DC? Is, I mean, if it's a fundamental part of all systems, but nobody in the United States to speak of is currently training DC. Is this the direction of the future? He, I was, if I'd had time, I would have gotten up and congratulated Well, you congratulated me and called me Dr. Freud at the end. Exactly. <laughs> uh, I did get on the table. I mean, Freud had his whole model. 1895, I've written a whole book on it. The double thing you cannot, attention is a double feedback, you have to get what's coming in, reflect it down into what you call the primary brain, or primary brain or basal ganglia, and back up again. And it, it's so close uh, to what he's talking about. The reason and cathexis and cathode, yeah, you know, the, that's, that's the, why the source of the name. But he never used the term, but whoever translated him already knew it was a negative term. There's a real history to this. In beginning in about 1930s, we began to get push-pull amplifiers. And the reason for that is those damn drifts. You know, they go way over, and you've got to readjust the whole equipment every little while. So we get push-pull amplifier, and they cancel out all the DC. And I, so I, after 1930, till I started talking about things like that in about the 1950s, it was ignored. Uh, almost it was you removed. Didn't see it? Yeah. You, you you got rid of it. Yeah. It was a damned artifact. Yeah. But it was a galvanometer, which is what they used in the 1890s. And by the way. Uh, Freud's publisher, the major journal in, in the field, he, that was his field, was studying DC potentials in the brain. I mean, this was all known. Yeah. Vienna was a pretty good place to, to be in the 1890s. I mean, they were smart. That and Harvard with William James, and they had very similar models. So what we've forgotten about DC is now going to emerge yeah. as being an important well, first, part of system regulation. Right. First of all, even slower other fields that are not all the way to DC are coming back. They're now called field potentials. I call them local rated potentials, which is an awkward name in languages brain in 71. But they are called field potentials and everybody's okay with them. But they're still made gotten from electrodes uh, on, uh, laid onto the brain or in, inserted. Uh, the EEG is on the scalp, and it's another level removed from what we call field potentials. But the EEG is made up completely of field potentials and DC. It does not record, I mean, there are a few, a few spike 
components that get in there, about 1% maybe. All the rest is feel DC stuff. And, and the Europeans have taken the direct current field in neurofeedback well, I have to tell and you, done well with slow cortical well, detections. Uh, one of my students, uh, John Stan, with whom I published the initial stuff on DC, he then went to Vienna, and they applied it to uh, school, to the teaching, and they would look at the uh, fluctuation of the alpha rhythm in people, in kids, and they would teach them only during the cathode okay, During the excitatory phase of, excitatory of the waveform. Or, yeah. the, or the inhibitor. And they found that kids learned about two or three times as fast. And I learned, I, my monkeys who, with whom where I messed up the DC, uh, uh, took seven times as long. But once they started learning, the learning slope of workers identical to those who did. It's this period of stationarity beforehand. And that's true of children who have problems uh, and learning problems and so on. Uh, it's that period of stationary, whatever is going on there, and then it just takes up. It's that switch you were talking about. So does that mean that coupling DC, that is, if you can get, for example, EEG activation to occur, mapped with a certain DC pattern, that that is a, that produces a more powerful learning effect? It has to do with attention and tension and thinking. And as you said earlier this morning, attention is getting something from the outside. You're paying attention and you pay. It takes you know, cost. Pay attention. Intention is what you pay to do something. You have to make a choice. I'm going to move my finger in your example or I'm not. So Intention is out, and I def def define thought as attention or intention to memory. It's internal. That's what it deals with. Um, that's what DC deals with. Yeah. That's what. Yeah, and, and the motor aspect of it being intention, the sensory aspect of it being the intention to perceive I or about that. intention. No. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the Europeans training slow cortical potentials are way ahead of the United States, obviously. And they've under-attended to the oscillatory EEG for feedback over there, primarily the Niels Burbomers work out of Germany. Yeah. Um, fabulous work, obviously, with a great literature behind it, very current literature. Uh, placebo control, randomized designs, well accepted, published in major journals, epilepsia and so forth. So if you have a group to sleep way, uh, and sleep, your DC goes way down. Interestingly, it goes up a little, but not as much in meditation as you'd expect. As med well, meditation, what they should have done is hypnosis. That's where it should go again, way up. And, yeah, exactly. The, the uh, meditation research at this point uh, shows powerful oscillatory gamma uh, yeah. activity in Davidson's current work of okay. near 80 hertz. But luckily, uh, with the current model that we're working on, our, our current groping, uh, as it were, uh, ties both the very slow and the very fast together. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the literature here is referred to is referred to as the bispectrum which is looking at the correlational relationship across the frequency spectrum at one spot. Um, similar to coherence looking at, at two spots and how they're covariating across the spatial domain. This is looking across the frequency domain and the location. So uh, the, this is a, an important metric of looking across from the very slow to the very fast because the rhythms appear to nest in uh, the yes. slower frequency has little packets of the fast frequencies embedded in them. And that's what we see in consciousness. That's not what we see in unconsciousness. 
Um, and uh, you know, as I say, this is a metric that's been FDA registered. And that metric is stuff. the measure of redundancy and complexity. All of the redundancy and all of the complexity that we see out here, and we're, we're, we're still putting on electrodes. And one of the big arguments in the field is, you know, well, it's important where you put the electrodes, or it's not important where you put the electrodes. As long as you have enough of them. <laughs> as long as you have enough of them. And I think 128. For some, if you're looking at the details, if you put 120 electrodes, over one side of the front lobes, that can really help you. But uh, 19 or so give you this picture already uh, on the surface that may be you know, enough uh, so the dense electrode away. These are all technical things. Yeah. Well, you started out in the field as, as being very much a localizationist. You cut yeah. things out <laughs> as a neurosurgeon. That's right. And uh, you gave up neurosurgery in the late 40s, if I recall, or early 50s, approximately. Yeah, as soon as I got my boards. There you go. <laughs> um, and, and But you came from this localization background of right. having been taught this is here and this is there. And <laughs> well, everything has got the sprain tumors. We didn't have x rays, we didn't have right. EEGs. No EEGs, yeah. mind you. Yes. So we did everything on the basis of the organization of symptoms. Yeah. And, and from that very localized background, you, you've um, moved to a very much a distributed model for memory. So distributed that your model, talking about memory as a hologram, and so distributed that your memory doesn't stop at your skin. It's an That's interference right. pattern, and it continues across infinite time space. And this was a DC shift. Yes. I met Lashley. <laughs> I met Lashley. Uh, uh, I was looking for a place to do surgery, do surgery away from hay fever zone. So I was looking at Duluth, and I was looking down Florida, uh, far away from. Anyway, so I landed in Jacksonville, Florida, and thought, uh, Yurti's lab was right there, so I called up Lashley. He was in charge of it. I said, I could possibly meet you and sort of like to do some research. It's just what we need. And so we met, and I said, I'm actually, I said, uh, I'm so pleased to meet you. Uh, I read your book uh, on brain intelligence, and uh, you're still alive. I said, Isn't you still believe this stuff that you wrote in your book? Yes, of course. But, well, you know, that was rat stuff. I mean, it couldn't possibly apply to humans. By the way, and I said, and by the way, what I was taught essentially makes this book worth about ten cents, and that's where I bought it in a second-hand bookstore. <laughs> and great sense of humor. We did this all the way through. I mean, we just, he teased me and I teased him. I put a lot of that in the book. It was such, such a wonderful relationship. And uh, so we decided on monkeys. And chimpanzees has been intermediate between rats and people. And then when I got to Virginia, I had to decide on you know, the work of rats and the people. And sometimes I had to tell the difference. And it was very difficult. And most people <coughs> behaved like rats. And some rats we took home, and they're very nice people. So, <laughs> I mean, you know, well, anyway. Uh, so that's how I really, actually, was probably, other than my father, uh, who you know, was already there as a scientist in the whole family. Uh, those were my primary so then Lashley just turned me upside down. And we did this program and, and nobody understood it. Lashley was much wiser than the Lashleyites. I mean he was talking about a particular kind of problem in psychology. He knew the difference between the front of the brain and the back of the brain. Well and he said so in a letter to Mentor. So and I've got lots of that in my book. So. Uh, but there are certain aspects like being able to write with your left hand first time, single left time, which cannot be explained on a localization basis. It's 
some motor equivalents of memory store, distributed memory store. Perception, we had no idea how perception did. So that was a big shift, and I learned. Yeah. And, and some of these non-local things end up bringing all sorts of implications that become uh, kind of spooky for some scientists. Well, like, definitely. See, 19th century was the center of fields, and then 20th century came along with statistics and uh, things. And I had all that reviewed as to what made me realize the difference. I mean, for instance, do you know that uh, a Gaussian distribution reflects symmetry? So when physicists are talking about symmetry and uh, symmetry groups and so on, in statistics you call these dots Gaussian distribution. And how I learned about that and so on. And so I went from being a behaviorist, that's another sh big shift. Some of the implications of the holonomic or holographic right. storage of memory and memory is not having an edge would be that your memory in fact could exist inside of my head at this distance. So if you, if you will read my books. Yes, yes. <laughs> I mean, you don't yes, have to yes, get yes. esoteric about this. Uh, most of our memory stored in our computers, our books, and so on. I mean, you know, and yes, and the heart math people that do you know how far fields can extend, but they don't have trouble with fields. Well, there are two things about fields. You never can see a field, you only see its effects. You can, you can count things, you can't count fields. So this is the big objection to my work, for instance, because I'm back in the 19th century, as the book reviews for 19, well, of my language of brain said, if we take us back to the 19th century, we've already left that. We no longer have to worry about the frequency of uh, electrical responses. We now have spikes, and we can count them. And we no longer, uh, well, in behavior, we no longer talk about consciousness and all this fuzzy stuff. We have behavior. Interesting twist to the spikes versus field. The Mayo Clinic in their initial laboratory after they translated Berger in 1930 and built their laboratory, they became famous because their uh, ability to localize tumors. Yeah. Now, the entire event was a mistake. They had made new electrodes out of a metal where they had to make their own electrodes. You had a big quartz plate and you drop a solder bead on it, stick a wire in it and smash it. No, well, that's enough. You got a flat electrode with a wire in it and that's what you'd use. But they had a different metal than the wire and they were having bimetallic spikes. <laughs> when, whenever they used this electrode that they had made, and by pure happenstance, they put this electrode that created spikes by pure accident over where the electrodes were laying over the tumor area. Five cases in a row, double blind. Take them to the, the, the x-ray lab and they, they predicted the location exactly. Now they didn't tell anybody until um, Charles Yeager retired, Professor Emeritus, after having moved to California and started Langley Porter and all of that. When he retired, he wrote a little note about the event. He said that they, they had mistaken these spikes as being the real signal because everybody knew spikes were in the brain. But these slow field things they dismissed as being artifact. And in retrospect, after they realized that it was just this damn electrode, they reanalyzed their data and found the slow focus was in fact the real data, <laughs> not the spike. That's but having nice. gained this huge reputation of being able to localize tumors with the EEG, they didn't rat themselves out. <laughs> but we all know now, you know, if you look for the slow focus in the EEG, not the spike for the tumor location, 
That's a great story. Speaking of serendipity, all of the EEG amps that we use now, they're transistorized amps, they're the, the yeah. nice push-pull or bipolar amps. Sure. Uh, all of these spun out of a dinner conversation of yours that was overheard by a grad student, Frank Offner. The Offner T-Type, the first transistorized EEG machine was made by an, an well, engineer grad student. It wasn't transistorized, they didn't have transistors. Well, uh, he made the first transistorized one as well, later. but he did the chopper stabilization That's at right. that point. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, he yeah. did the first EEG, he got enough yeah. amplification. Yeah. Uh, he and Grass were the two people who did it, the Offner and Grass machines, yeah. even today. Yeah. So, Offner was sold to Beckman, and Beckman was sold to Tekka, and Tekka is now Nicolay. So the, the, the lineage of That's all right. the modern EEG equipment spins from a when dinner conversation overheard by an engineer. I went like this, we recorded from auditory cortex, and the loudspeaker went poof, poof. You know, we could hear it, it was sort of a Gerard's laboratory, it was a big, 1936 or so. 37 at the latest. And I said to Frank, if you move card cardiogram, why can't you record this? Why do you need a loudspeaker? If you can do it on a loudspeaker, you should be able to do it on a oscilloscope. But this weird baseline drift was corrected by his instrument by resetting the baseline with a little reed oscillator at 200 hertz. I've got one of those. In fact, I've, I've got Charlie Yeager's when he retired. Uh -huh. Uh, um, I had one back in Dakota when I was there, but it's a fabulous old amp. We rebuilt it, made it fully functional, DC to 100 hertz, you know, a fabulous amp. Uh, but you could hear them if they weren't working right, because the 200 hertz was tuned to 200 hertz, and if you got something that was a couple of hertz off, you'd hear this beat frequency, whoa, 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 whoa. So it was, it was always, you always knew when you had to send it to the shop. Great old, old things. And, and the original EEG amps were you know, big tube amplifiers oh. that you could heat a room with, you know, a kilowatt of energy to power them up. You couldn't take it around to do it, you got Gibbs hometown. That's right. Yeah. Well, Gibbs was there, yeah. yeah. Okay, let's hang it up. Any other